I'll commence, and I'd like to commence with the University of Queensland. Um, and I direct it to, to whichever one of you feels best able to um, assist. But what has the university learned from the, the Drew Pavlou experience? Well, Senator Patterson, perhaps I could um, respond to that, uh, at least at the, at the outset. Um, I listened very carefully to Mr Pablo's uh, testimony last week in your committee, and uh, with your indulgence, I would like to put a few matters on record before getting more directly to your question. Uh, Mr Pablo painted a picture uh, where he was a victim and the university was a villain. Uh, he presented a story, and I don't think I'm embellishing it, uh, where there was an orchestrated conspiracy by myself and the then Vice-Chancellor to stitch him up, trumped up charges relating to his views on China, take those charges through to a kangaroo court uh, to ensure that in this telling verdict uh, came through. Uh, and having done that, both uh, myself and the then Vice Chancellor were subsequently uh, rewarded for our efforts uh, to the tune of several million dollars. Um, can I just say that the truth is rather more pedestrian. And neither the then Vice Chancellor nor myself were involved in the instituting of disciplinary processes against Mr. Pablo. Uh, I did not know that the processes had started uh, before that started. I was not aware of the misconduct charges until I had read them in the media. And there's nothing unusual about that because with most of our disciplinary processes, either the Vice Chancellor and certainly not the Chancellor are in any way involved. Uh, I think the process followed all the requirements of due process. Um, misconduct charges were laid, natural justice was offered. As the process went through its various stages, some of those charges were upheld, some were not. And when it got to the Senate, which is my responsibility, uh, nine of the 11 charges were dismissed and the uh, penalty was radically reduced from two years to one semester. So if this were in fact a, a kangaroo court, I think it must be one of the rare occasions where a kangaroo court dismissed most of the charges and reduced the penalty. Uh, and as for being rewarded to the tune of several million, can I just say that uh, my remuneration as Chancellor, which is $80,000 a year, goes directly to a scholarship fund in the university and I receive uh, no personal gain from the office. I just think it's important to uh, put that on the record. Uh, I don't know why Mr. Pablo continues to hold to his conspiracy theory, uh, but can I say, Senator Patterson, that I am surprised and somewhat concerned that the chairman of this committee would publicly endorse that conspiracy theory uh, in the absence of any supporting evidence apart from what Mr. Pavlou has said. Uh, I find it quite remarkable, frankly, that even before these hearings were held, uh, that the chairman should refer to the victimization uh, of a student at the University of Queensland for his activism. Chinese human rights. Uh, not a claim of victimization, not an allegation of victimization, not a report of victimization, but a straight out uh, all unqualified accusation. Uh, and I think that's rather unfortunate for a committee which is tasked 
uh, to come to the truth on these matters. And it is particularly unfortunate that such a comment should be made before any hearings were held and before the testimony of the University of Queensland was even listened to. Uh, I think we find ourselves in the rather unfortunate position uh, where what the university says on this issue, Senator Patterson, uh, is clearly not believed by you. When we say that we are committed to freedom of expression, when we say that no student should be penalised for legally expressing political views, when we point out that none of the charges uh, of misconduct that were upheld relate to statements on China, it would appear that none of that is accepted uh, by the chairman. So what I would suggest to you, and I think this is one of the lessons learned, is let's get all of the facts on the table. Uh, I will, with the concurrence of Mr. Pavlou, uh, agree to table the full report of the disciplinary board and then the full report of the Senate Dis Student Disciplinary Appeals Committee, um, redacted only to the extent that the identity of third parties uh, is required. That way, your committee can make judgments about what did and didn't happen, and importantly, make its own judgment based on the facts and the evidence of whether or not a student was victimized for their political views. Thank you, Mr. Varghese. I've uh, provided you with a, a full and uninterrupted opportunity uh, to put that on the record uh, in deference to the fairness of the process, and um, you're completely entitled to your views and your reflections. Uh, and uh, I'm glad you had the opportunity to do that, given that um, allegations have been made about you and your former colleague in this forum as well. Uh, I welcome your commitment to get the full facts on the table, and I look forward to establishing that uh, today with you in evidence. I don't expect you to expect to accept all of the evidence um, or the claims made by Mr. Pavlou. Um, but I am interested to know whether you think there's anything that the university mishandled about that affair, whether there's any reflections about that, and whether if another incident like it emerged today, whether the university would handle it any differently. Well, Senator Patterson, no process is ever perfect, and all organisations learn uh, from experience. Uh, and. Um, we have recently, at the Vice Chancellor's uh, instigation, commissioned a review of our disciplinary processes. Uh, and I'm sure the Vice Chancellor would be happy to brief the committee on the outcome of that review. Uh, we're in the process of, of considering its implementation. Uh, and uh, that will no doubt result in some changes to our processes. But the review itself, which was an external review, I think did conclude that the system was fundamentally sound, but could be improved in a number of areas, and uh, we will proceed to uh, to act on those, including through the uh, the governance committee of the Senate. Okay, but that doesn't um, give me any concrete things about how you would handle it differently if there was another one today. I mean, did the university err in any way in handling Mr. Pavlou's matter? I think the university's handling of it was entirely consistent with a well-established disciplinary process. Uh, I don't think uh, the university mishandled any of those disciplinary processes. I think one of the difficulties, frankly, that the university faced uh, was that it was bound to uh, a level of confidentiality in what it could say about the substance of the case uh, at a time when uh, one of the parties to the process didn't feel so bound. Um, and that meant that our ability to deal with this in the media in particular uh, was somewhat constrained. Right. So other than um, being able to publicly comment on it, the university 
doesn't feel that it mishandled this matter in any way? Uh, my view is that it was handled in accordance with established processes. Okay. Um, in the spirit of getting all the facts on the table, it's been publicly reported that the university engaged two external law firms uh, to handle this matter. Is that, first of all, is that true that two law firms were uh, engaged to handle this matter? I think, Senator, it was three law firms. And the reason why it was three law firms was that they were three clients, if I could put it that way. Uh, there was a need for legal advice to be made available to uh, the disciplinary board, which is the first stage of our disciplinary process. Uh, there was a need for legal advice to be made available to the Senate Disciplinary Appeals Committee. Uh, and there was a need for legal advice to be made available to the university administration, which is responsible for initiating and seeing through uh, the disciplinary process. How much has been expended on engagement with those firms? Or well, perhaps the vice chancellor could address that. I can confirm that it's approximately two hundred and eighty-seven thousand dollars, Senator. Thank you. Were any other external consultants, for example, public relations consultants or any other firms engaged uh, by the university? Not to my knowledge, Senator. Uh, Senator Patterson, it, it, it may have been that the communications area of, uh, of, the, of the university uh, engaged or sought some external advice on the handling of the um, issue from a media and communications point of view, but um, I as Chancellor don't have details of that, but I'm sure we'd that, be happy to that is, that. Sorry, that is true. We, we did seek advice on handling some of these issues because the, uh, the media that was around at the time. Which firm was engaged? Well, I'd have to take that on notice, Senator. Thank you. And we, your... we, we will provide that information. Thank you. Could you also take on notice how much was spent uh, on that uh, engagement yeah. um, and in, in no other cons external consultants were engaged? Not to my knowledge, but we can take that on notice too, Senator. Okay, so at least $287,000 uh, of money was spent on external consultants, perhaps more, um, in addition to the university's internal resources. Um, how much money did the university expend pursuing the alleged assailants of Mr Pavlou at that protest? Uh, well, if, Senator Patterson, if you're if you're going to the question of how the university responded to what had happened at that protest and uh, the unacceptable behaviour at that protest by some parties, um, my understanding and um, uh, the provost may be able to. Uh, provide you with more detail, uh, is that we did ask our investigations unit to conduct an inquiry uh, into what happened and where responsibility lay. Uh, that inquiry did seek uh, statements and evidence and information uh, from uh, quite a large number of students, including I think it's the case that very few responded to the request for information. I don't think Mr. Pavlou was one of them, but that's neither here nor there. Um, and as a consequence, the investigation itself was unable to come to a firm conclusion uh, as to who was responsible for the disruption of that uh, demonstration. Uh, I understand there may have been other inquiries by the police as well, but that's not something I'm familiar with. I'll, I'll restate my, my question for you uh, because it's a simple factual question. How much money did the university expend on any external consultants to try to identify the alleged assailants of Mr Pavlou at the protest? Well, to the, to, to the best of my knowledge, Senator Patterson, no external consultant was engaged. This was an investigation carried out by our internal 
investigation. You know, yes, and the which internal. Is by a form of police person. Thank you. The internal investigation was fruitless, and so upon um, that process being unsuccessful, you didn't seek to engage uh, an external law firm, a private investigator, a PR firm, anyone to assist you pursuing this matter. Well, our internal investigator, who is an experienced investigator with a police background, was unable to arrive at any firm conclusions. And um, I would have to uh, assume from that that uh, he would not have been in a better position had he had access to external advice. But mm, that's quite an assumption, uh, Mr. Varghese. Um, it, it seems that the university, uh, faced with an opportunity to pursue Mr. Pavlou, was happy to expend $300,000 or thereabouts of student fees and taxpayers' money, but when uh, unable to pursue the other participants in that uh, incident, which you described as uh, inappropriate and unacceptable, that the university decided to seek no external assistance to do so. If I may, Chancellor, and make a comment on that one, Senator. Please. Um, the university did use its own internal investigations unit to do that, as the Chancellor has indicated. Uh, we have a fairly experienced team of people with background in investigation. But at some point, it does come to the limitation of powers that the university has. And to take matters further, it uh, would matter very little with us taking in external people. Those powers are not able to be transferred. Mm. Uh, I do believe that Mr. Pavlou raised this matter with the police, with the Queensland Police Service. Uh, they are in a much better position to take it forward uh, than we are in this university. Mm. You, you do have a duty of care to your students, though, and one of your students appears on video do. footage Absolutely to have been assaulted, do. and it doesn't appear that so, beyond your internal processes you sought to pursue it with anywhere near as much the vigour uh, as you did, Mr Pavlou. Well, we, we, we are limited to the extent that we can pursue things because of the powers that we have okay. or the lack of uh, uh, Senator, um, Senator Patterson, could I, could I just say I'm more than happy to make available to the committee the full report of our internal investigation unit. And you can form your own judgment as to how thorough it was and whether uh, it would have benefited from uh, some external advice. Um, and can I just say the idea that we are in pursuit of Mr. Pablo and you insist on using this sort of language uh, is rather unfortunate for a committee that's meant to be looking at uh, what happened and what didn't happen in these issues. Thank you, Mr. Vargesi. We would welcome um, that material. Um, is uh, Consul General Su Jie from the People's Republic of China still an honorary professor at the University of Queensland? Yes, he is. Um, Mr. Vargesi, with your background as a former uh, Secretary of DFAT and a, a former Director General of ONA, um, you will know how unusual it is for a Australian Foreign Minister to publicly condemn a Consul General uh, for their public commentary. Um, Suje, uh, in my opinion, incited violence against uh, students and after his statement, Mr Pavlou uh, received very significant uh, death threats to himself and his family. Um, why do you think it's appropriate for someone who's engaged in that sort of conduct and has been condemned by the Foreign Minister of Australia for it to remain as an honorary professor of your university? Well, let me make a number of comments. Uh, one, I entirely agree with the Foreign Minister's criticism of the remarks made by the Consul General. Secondly, I think it is completely unacceptable for students or indeed anybody else to be the subject of death threats. Thirdly, in my own comment, including an op-ed that I wrote not long after those demonstrations, I made it very clear uh, that restricting freedom of expression through intimidation, and I'm quoting here, restricting that freedom through intimidation and disruption is unacceptable, as is threatening the families of those who participated. Now, you ask me why the Consul General uh, remains an adjunct professor. Um, the appointment of a uh, foreign diplomat as adjunct professors go back a long time. 
I must say I had not been aware of it uh, and I do not agree with the uh, uh, with the appointment of serving foreign officials as adjunct professors and when this matter came to the attention of the Senate uh, we decided to end that long-standing policy. Uh, the Consul General clearly made his unacceptable comments in his capacity as Consul General, not in his capacity as an adjunct professor. Uh, and so, and so um, the question of terminating his appointment on the basis of those comments, in my view, uh, did not arise. Uh, Mr. Vagasi, I'm sorry, I do have to interrupt you there to seek a clarification on that. Are you seriously saying that the same individual who holds two positions, that we can make a technical and artificial distinction about which capacity it, they made their comments in and therefore just ignore the implications of that for their ongoing role at the university? Uh, I'm saying you can make a distinction. It's your words as to whether that, that's a technical distinction. Uh, but clearly, he was speaking as Consul General, and that was clear from the Foreign Minister's comments, and it's been clear indeed from court cases that uh, have subsequently unfolded. And I'll, I'll make this point to you, Senator Patterson. The Foreign Minister, in rightly criticising the Consul General, did not take the extra step of declaring him persona non grata which would be the equivalent of terminating an appointment. I'm sorry, I don't see those two things as equivalent at all. Expelling a diplomat from our country and, re and requiring them to return home and asking them to no longer be an honorary professor or adjunct professor at university are clearly in different categories of seriousness. You are not seriously suggesting they're the same. Well, Senator Patterson, I'm assuming that you are seriously suggesting that the comments were completely unacceptable and therefore action should have been taken. And now you're saying that action can be taken up to a point by one party, but should go further by another party. That's entirely your privilege to take such a view. But my view is he made those comments as Consul General. He did not make those comments as an adjunct professor. Uh, and therefore, uh, I don't think there was a basis on which to terminate his appointment. Mr. Vargesi, he is the same person. Let's say uh, a student at your university uh, committed something against the university's policies. Are they doing that as their capacity as a private citizen or as a university student? Do you draw that distinction? Well, it would depend. It would, it would depend on the circumstances. I mean, we, we have members of Senate who engage in full-time professional occupations, and it may well be that from time to time they do something in their professional life uh, which may warrant uh, a reprimand, but which would not warrant terminating their position on the Senate. I mean, you know, you've got to deal with these cases in the circumstances in which you find them. Hmm. So, so what reprimand, if any, have you given to uh, the Consul General? I haven't given any reprimand to the Consul General and I don't think the university has given a reprimand to him because he was not making statements in his capacity as an adjunct professor. I mean, if, if you want the university to reprimand uh, uh, a diplomat for saying things that the university disagrees with, uh, we would be in the full-time business of issuing reprimands. Well, Mr. Vargasi, I think I, I wouldn't expect you to, to make that about any other uh, diplomatic representative, just the one that's an honorary professor on your campus who you have bestowed upon with a recognition, uh, which presumably conveys some sort of endorsement or warmth uh, from on part of the university towards him, uh, when he's clearly, had he made these comments to use your distinction in his capacity at his, as a university uh, academic or official, would clearly um, disciplinary action would need to be taken against him. Uh, but you've satisfied yourself that because of a technical artificial distinction that no action is required from the university? Well, you're putting the construct artificial on it. I actually think it's a real distinction because it, it goes to the capacity in which he made the comments. Well, I think the record will show that the university is comfortable as having with an, as an honorary professor someone who has incited violence against their own students. 
The university is comfortable with its position that it completely rejects the comments made by the honorary con You just Council won't do anything and, about it. Well, if you think that's doing nothing about it, that's your, that's your um, observation. I think that's what the record will show. Um, I have so many more questions for you and other universities, but I'm very keen to share the call with my colleagues and perhaps we'll return to these and other matters soon. Um, uh, turning back to the uh, University of Queensland, um, uh, you might have seen evidence from your former Vice-Chancellor, Professor Hoy, before the committee this morning. Um, I asked him about an interview he did uh, upon becoming Vice-Chancellor of the University of Adelaide and in that interview, which he repeated his view today before the committee, he said that the university's decision to accept funding uh, from the Chinese government for courses, for courses at UQ, was a stupid uh, thing to do. Um, who at the university thought it was a good idea? Um, I'm, I'm happy to take uh, that, that question, uh, Senator Patterson, uh, and, and respond by saying, obviously, uh, our Confucius Institute has been in place here at the University of Queensland since 2009. Right from the beginning, it's been absolutely clear that UQ has absolute responsibility for curriculum, for the approval of the courses, uh, for the nature of, of the uh, material within the courses. So, and that has been very clear right uh, through uh, from the beginning of the Confucius we, we might return here. to that matter in a moment because I have follow-up questions yep. there about that. But just on the four courses, who thought it was a good idea? Who um, approved it? Uh, so what, what uh, as I understand, had, had occurred was that once the courses uh, had been approved, so this is units, we call them courses, but they are units of study, had been approved, uh, then at, at the school level uh, there was discussions between the school and the Confucius Institute around some funding to assist with the development. Aware that, uh, and, and that was approved at that level. Since that uh, has been uh, discovered, Senator, it would now not be possible and we have uh, put in place changes to the governance uh, arrangements around the Institute and the executive management of, of the Confucius Institute uh, that that would not be allowed into the future and no funding uh, since that was discovered, has been provided by the Confucius Institute for the development of course material. Mm. But that still doesn't at least directly answer my question of, of how it was approved, who approved it? It, it was, uh, and I, I will say uh, here, Senator, I wasn't at the University of Queensland then. I understand that, Presbyterian. If you want to hand to Mr Varghese or your colleague, uh, Professor Byrne, I'd be very happy for them to answer for you. Uh, my, my understanding is that it was approved at the level um, of the uh, uh, the um, executive level uh, in terms of uh, signing off on uh, expenditure at, at the uh, Confucius Institute, but okay. Professor Byrne may want to add to that. I think that decision was made at the school level, so not, not in the executive level of the university. So does that mean a, a, a dean of a faculty? Like, translate that to a, at least a position. I don't. I'm not necessarily asking about the actual individual at this stage, anyway. But who is the who would the decision maker be? Well, it, 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 there are various circumstances in this university where, in the development of our courses, we interact with people uh, outside our university. You know, for example, mm -hmm. our medical programs uh, have deep connections into the health system. Uh, we actually get an enormous in-kind support. Uh, for our medical programs, among other sorts of programs that we have. We are trying increasingly uh, within our university to develop work integrated learning ones when we interact with a wide variety of companies, they provide in kind support. The decision making process to do that is done at the local school level. Mm. Okay, that um, still doesn't answer my question uh, whether the decision maker was an individual a committee, um, presumably some sort of, when a financial relationship is entered into by the university with an external party, um, there is some kind of sign-off process, uh, a contract, a decision, a well, committee uh, my, meeting my, which is minuted. Uh, we, will, we will chase this down, but my guess is it will be at the head of school level. Right. It, it doesn't fill me with great com comfort that you're not able to identify that now, given that everybody agrees this was a mistake and should never have happened, but you're not clear of how, about how it happened. Senator Patterson, if I could just repeat uh, what, what Professor Berner said, we will provide further detail. Our understanding is it was requested, the support was requested 
by the school um, once the courses had been approved and uh, approval was given through the Confucius Institute uh, and we can indicate uh, where that exact where that precise approval was given in, in, in follow-up. Thank you. That'll be helpful. On notice, I'd be interested in both that. Who approved it at the Confucius Institute and who, who requested it at the school level for each of the four courses, if it was a different person for each course? Um, returning now to your early comment, uh, Professor Terry, about uh, how, uh, in relation to the Confucius Institute, it has always been clear that the university has been in charge of curriculum and other matters. Why then was it necessary for the university to renegotiate its contract with Hanban for its Confucius Institute to insert protections for the university's autonomy and academic freedom that presumably were not in the pre-existing agreement? Well, I think, uh, Senator Patterson, you would appreciate that across time and obviously uh, we, we, when, when agreements come up for renewal, we always uh, go back and have a look at the agreements and seek to um, strengthen them where, where required. Hanban, as you know, the dissolution did occur in 2019. Uh, in 2019, we therefore took the opportunity to look at our agreement with the view to further strengthen UQ's governance and autonomy with the new Chinese International Education Foundation, formerly Hanban, and the new Centre for Language Education and Cooperation from the Ministry for Education. So we took that opportunity, as we would with all of our agreements when they come up for renewal. We have a, a, another look at them, determine whether across the passage of time there are issues that we want to strengthen. So we did work then to further strengthen and, and be uh, put in more detail around uh, UQ's governance and, and uh, overall autonomy. But, um, and again, we can provide this information to the committee. In the original agreement, uh, it is clear that uh, there is an obligation by the university to ensure that all activities of the Confucius Institute meet UQ's Australian and Queensland regulatory requirements associated with courses, programs and other presentations delivered. But I just the reason why I ask is if it was always clear uh, the university's autonomy and control, then why was it necessary for stronger protections and safeguards to be put in place in the new agreement? There must have been something defective about the previous one if the new one required strengthening. We've lost your audio. I, I do see you nodding and perhaps indicating agreement, but. <laughs> no, no, I did accidentally uh, mute myself at that point. Um, as, as I've said, Senator Patterson, I think, you know, that's across a 10 year period. Our, our Confucius Institute was established in 2009. Uh, in 2019, uh, obviously further revisions were made. Again, that is good practice mm. around um, agreements when they come up for review. Um, and and uh, obviously across that period of time, we, we wanted to just ensure the, that the autonomy clause was, was, was very clear. Yeah, I, I mean, I just don't really understand, Professor Terry, your reluctance to acknowledge that if improvements are required to an agreement, that therefore there was something wrong with the previous agreement. I mean, it's just a matter of logic, surely. I, I think the original agreement had the statement that I just read out and it, and it was relatively brief. In the new agreement, we've added in detail, maintaining the Universities of Queensland is committed to maintaining its autonomy over all course content, a manner of instruction for all programs, teaching standards, quality assurance, student admissions, etc. So there's more detail mm. uh, that have been put there. And I think the view was of the university that there was a need to strengthen uh, that uh, particular clause. Good, and on, on that we are in complete agreement. Um, one final matter with the University of Queensland, uh, which I'll direct to you, Mr Varghese. Um, you and I have had an exchange through um, the media and public debate about the remuneration arrangements for Professor Terry's predecessor, Professor Hoy, um, uh, after I noted in a speech in the Senate that Professor Hoy received a bonus for achieving a range of KPIs. Um, one of those KPIs was strengthening the university's relationship with China, and one piece of evidence that was given to demonstrate that he had succeeded in doing so was that uh, I think nearly two thirds of commencing students the next academic year were expected to be from mainland China. Um, returning to your conversation with Mr. Lisa and your 2018 speech about diversification and over reliance and over dependence, um, 
isn't it setting up a vice chancellor to fail to remunerate them and, and reward them for what sounds to me like putting all your eggs in one basket rather than the opposite, which is diversification? Uh, well, Senator Patterson, I, I, I think um, firstly um, that, that, as I recall, a very constructive exchanges on this was one of 16 KPIs. So the bonus didn't turn on performance in China. Secondly, um, diversification is also part of the Vice Chancellor's uh, remit and um, objective. Uh, so I, I don't think there is a fundamental contradiction between saying to a Vice Chancellor, uh, you're responsible for a range of important external relationships. One of them is China. Uh, and we recognise that um, you have made progress on that. Uh, and also saying to the Vice Chancellor that we want to ensure that we have uh, as diverse uh, a, a range of source countries of international students as we can as we can find. So I think it's a uh, you know it's a it's a false distinction. Frankly, they, they do seem to be a little bit in conflict, though, don't they? Because two thirds of students coming from one country is not diversification; it's the opposite of diversification. And I, you know, I, I would empathise with the professor. Uh, Hoy in contemplating his incentive structure to be on the one hand be told, great job, 66% of our students are going to come from the mainland China next year, and also you need to diversify our international student body. I mean, surely those things are, there is a tension between those things. Well, I think where the tension arises is um, the way in which supply and demand for international students uh, operates in what is uh, a global marketplace. I mean, the reason why all Australian universities have a large share of Chinese students amongst their international students is that demand from China is stronger than demand from other markets. Uh, and so um, uh, all universities are responding to those market signals. Where diversification comes in is to say, uh, we also want to ensure that over time, because this is not a switch you can turn uh, on and off um, overnight, uh, we want to get to uh, a better stage than that level of dependence on a single market. So, you know, it's not, it's, it's, it's not an easy strategy to implement. Um, and there's a reason why virtually every university has struggled with hitting a diversification objective, and mm -hmm. that is where demand uh, is in the market. Sure. Uh, let, let me try uh, put it another way. Um, would you be comfortable going forward if uh, roughly two thirds of UQ's international students came from mainland China? Or would you think that's a bit high and I'd like to see it be uh, more diverse? Oh, I think the latter. Right. And so in uh, Professor Terry's KPIs going forward for her, um, would she be rewarded or recognised for meeting a KPI if she increased the number of international students coming from China to two thirds? Um, well, I haven't had that discussion directly with uh, Professor Terry, uh, but um, she is as committed as I am to reach a diversification um, strategy or to, or to secure a diversification strategy. So when it comes time to have that discussion, we will do so in the context of the importance of the university having as um, diversified a um, international student cohort as we can possibly manage in what is um, a global market. And I appreciate that Professor Terry is very new in the role, but presumably she already has some form of contract which would set out the terms uh, under which she'd be granted a bonus as her predecessor was. Um, is among those KPIs, 16 as you said, um, is one of them uh, engagement with China or uh, the international student pro proportion coming from China? Uh, well, um I can assure you that diversification is in her KPIs and to the best of my recollection, we have not set 
um, a China target yeah. in the KPIs. Okay, so that would be a change from Professor Hoy's arrangements. No, we didn't. We didn't set a, a target for KPIs for Professor Hoy either. I mean, uh, I was making the point that 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 managing the China relationship was an important part of his overall functions as vice chancellor. Uh, one of many, many things he had to do, okay. uh, and that he had managed that relationship successfully from the university's point of view. What I'm trying to understand, I mean, Mr. Varghese, is what, if anything, is different about the incentive structure you're providing your new vice chancellor compared to your previous vice chancellor? Well, I think it's not dissimilar to what a lot of other universities are doing, which is to put even more emphasis on diversification. Okay, so um, am I to understand then for your, from your evidence that you are giving a different incentive structure to your new vice chancellor compared to the one that your previous vice chancellor had? Well, each set of KPIs uh, will change from year to year. Yes, of course, Mr. Varghese, but I want to know how they change. I mean, work with me here. I'm trying to give you credit for something and some and progress that you've made. Um, you seem to be really declining to do so, to accept that credit. Well, I mean, I can take you through each of the KPIs uh, at some point, Senator Patterson, if that's helpful to you. I can't do it now because I don't I, have them in front no, of it, No, I don't think it would be helpful because I suspect like the ones that I've seen for Professor Hoy, and I have seen all of them, they are very standard, exactly what you would expect of a vice chancellor. But this one stood out, uh, engagement with China, that stood out, a single country being identified uh, as a KPI for a vice chancellor. And what I'm trying to understand is, is that, st is that the status quo? Does it prevail or has that changed? Uh, I'd, I'd stand to be corrected by the Vice Chancellor, but I don't think there is a specific reference to China in Professor Terry's new KPIs. Well, that is good news, and I welcome that, and that is a positive note uh, for me to conclude my questions on.